Good morning and welcome to Finnehy Methodist Church for our Sunday worship. All around the world, in different lands and in different languages, people are worshipping God this day. So whether you're worshipping in ones or twos or in a family unit, we are joining as part of the great congregation in heaven and on earth, giving praise to God. So I invite you now to join with me as we do that in our prayers. Let us pray. Praise be to you, O God. Creator of this world, you spoke the word and all things came into being. You breathed and gave life to us. You are mighty in majesty and glory, and we worship you, our Lord and our God. In the face of fear and threat, your power is greater. In the face of hatred and mistrust, your love is stronger. In the face of despair and disappointment, your hope is eternal. You are worthy of our worship, for in your power you love us and you care for each one of us. Not one of us is too small or insignificant for you to reach out and touch us. And whilst our words may not be adequate, nevertheless you delight in them. Our discipleship may be faltering, but you encourage us onwards each step of the way. Glory be to you, O God. We thank you, O Lord, that your love is not simply mythical or theoretical. You have shown us your love and care in the things that you provide us with. So we thank you for the daily bread that sustains us, for the wonder of science and technology that we can use in our homes and workplaces. We are thankful for the beauty of art and music that entertains us and lifts our spirits. And we thank you, Lord, for your love that is revealed in the care of others, friends or family. And we give thanks to you for those who care for us and our community, especially in these days, those who make the extra effort to provide comfort or support for the vulnerable amongst us. As you have blessed us with so many things, may we, in love for you, be a blessing to those around us. This we pray in the name of him who has given us redemption and life eternal, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Our reading this morning is taken from the letter to Philemon. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. To Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker. Also to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier. And to the church that meets in your home. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none other than Paul, an old man and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent, so that any favour you do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So, if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self, I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. And one more thing. Prepare a guest room for me, because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Here endeth God's word. Amen. Appearances can be deceiving. Which of the ladies in these photographs do you think are Christians? One? Two? Maybe more? In fact, they're all Christians. Anita uses this slide whenever she's teaching her students RE, and it catches them out every time. You see, our view of others is influenced by a variety of factors. Our upbringing, our culture, uh, yes, our prejudices as well. The past week or two has seen the whole issue of race and racism and pr discrimination being blown open, not just in the United States, but right across the planet. What started out with the terrible death of George Floyd on a city street in Minneapolis has become a topic of discussion and protest right across the globe. It has drawn attention to the way in which prejudices and discrimination have gone unchallenged, and that people have suffered because of the the blindness or the ignorance of others. And for Christians, this is a challenge too. The idea that there are other people who have suffered and we've maybe done nothing about it. Or indeed that our silence has maybe perpetuated an injustice. And that rightly makes us uncomfortable because we know that God's word challenges and provokes in every generation. We are taught 
through his word of God's view of all people and of how he expects to, us to respond to the injustices around us. The one thing we seem to remember about Paul's letter to Philemon is that it's the shortest book in the Bible, and yet we still never seem to read it very often because when we do, it often leaves us feeling a little bit uncomfortable. Paul is writing to a man called Philemon about Philemon's slave Onesimus, who has run away and come to stay with Paul. Paul is very fond of Onesimus, but he writes to Philemon saying that he's going to send him back to his owner. And that makes us feel a little bit uneasy because it gives the impression that Paul seems to be supporting the slave trade. How can that be? In trying to understand that, I think there are a few things that we need to take into account, first of all. Slavery, of course, was very common in Paul's day. Slaves were used for every kind of conceivable work. Some laboured in cruel conditions in quarries and in mines. Others would have been tutors for the children of rich families. Slaves were themselves a huge proportion of the population. They were the workforce of the Roman Empire. And it's slightly different from the more modern form of slavery that we saw in the 18th and 19th centuries, where slaves were used by industrialists and, and great men in order to make their own personal profits greater. It's easier, I think, sometimes, and some of you may have heard me call this before, that slaves were, if you like, the Duracell batteries of their day. They were used for their power or for whatever use they could bring. And whenever they had run down their energy or their usefulness, they were simply cast aside. Slaves were seen as normal. Whenever people attacked their town or village next door and they captured it, then they captured the things that were in it. If there was silver, they took it. If there was cattle, they drove the cattle home. If there were people there, then they were slaves. They, they now owned them. And so people looked on slaves as property, belongings, in the exact same way as silver or livestock. They now owned these people. This is why it's so important when in Paul's letter to Philemon, he describes Onesimus as his brother. Onesimus to Paul isn't an object. He's a person. And it's not just in Paul's letter to Philemon that we find this attitude coming through. In Colossians chapter 3, and in Galatians chapter 3, amongst other places as well, Paul states that there is no distinction between slave and free in Christ. Paul no longer sees humanity as having a division within it that would allow some people to be treated as subhuman. They are all equal. In this country, it seems to have become crystallised around the issue of statues which is a little bit more difficult for us than in the United States, because we don't actually have statues of people who are fighting a war in order to preserve slavery. Our statues are a little bit more complex. The Duke of Wellington in Glasgow is a famous and well-known statue, and it's become a target in this discussion, because in his life he fought wars in India, which saw the destruction of uh, local villages. But that statue has long been a symbol of anti-establishment in Glasgow anyway, that people traditionally mock it by sticking a traffic cone on its head. And this week, that traffic cone became a black traffic cone with the symbol of Black Lives Matter. So is it now a symbol of repression or a symbol of support? It's not an easy answer. That complexity points us to a deeper issue. For many of us in this part of the world, the issue of people being hurt or killed because of the colour of their skin is easy to condemn. It's them Americans, it's those folk over there. 
but it becomes much harder to address the issues of prejudice that lie closer to home. They might be skin colour, or it might be language, or culture, or religion, or class. There's no more common put down than I've heard in Methodist churches that goes along the lines of, well, they're not from round here. They're not one of us, you know. And whatever the basis for that kind of comment is, the consequence is the same. We're treating people differently, giving other people less dignity, valuing their opinions less, not considering their contributions that would otherwise be the case. Now, I find myself challenged by this. Recently, I was watching the Reverend Nigel Mackey's video on Facebook. Nigel is the chaplain of Wesley College, and he was using his final year assembly to uh, talk about race and discrimination. But as the nature of Facebook is, as soon as that uh, video was finished, another one popped up randomly, and it was taken in a council estate in Limerick where the Gardaí were involved in a confrontation between locals in the estate. And I found myself watching the, the arguments and the scuffles that were going on and listening to the accents and thinking, typical, they sound like travellers. What do you expect? And then I felt ashamed. We all need to be aware of our prejudices and repent of our attitudes and words and actions that make other people feel less than the person God created them to be. Nigel's video assembly also raised another important point. That video of George Floyd's death has been shown all round the world, but nobody seems to have asked the question, why did the people taking the video not intervene? Why did they not say anything? They knew it was wrong, and yet they felt it was more important to stand there and video it. On public transport and in our streets, the incidents of abuse and intimidation happen, but we are too often ready to walk by or hide behind our mobile phones. None of us likes to think that in the story of the Good Samaritan, we'd be the priest or the Levite. But our inaction can just be the same. As Methodist people, we recall that one of John Wesley's last letters was written to a young William Wilberforce to encourage him in his campaign against the slave trade. And Wesley wrote, Oh, be not weary of well-doing. Our desire not to get involved may actually allow a greater evil to take place. And getting involved won't always be easy or make us popular, but it must surely be right where there is injustice. Our ministerial session of conference this week approved a statement encouraging all Methodists to combat racism in our communities and in our hearts. Now, Onesimus reappears in Colossians chapter 4. Paul says that he is helping him in his ministry. We don't know what happened with Philemon, but clearly Paul saw this slave as a co-worker in the gospel. And Paul in his letter to Philemon not only hints that he's sending him home, but that Philemon should set Onesimus free, and that Paul is willing to pay for any damages incurred. Here is Paul putting a challenge to Philemon, but in such a way that Philemon would find it hard to resist. Paul is teaching Philemon that Anasimus is a person, a person of worth, and equal to him. So challenging the attitudes of racism and prejudice may not simply be just to start an argument, but rather it's to let people see that in Christ, 
all people have value and worth. For evil to flourish, it only requires that good people do nothing. It's a paraphrase on an old quote that is usually attributed to William Burke. But the truth of it is timeless. Sadly, prejudice, discrimination and racism have been with us for centuries too. A change in attitude only happens when people are prepared to do something about it. As Christians, we must examine ourselves and repent of the things that have caused hurt and harm to others. We are made in God's image and we are redeemed by his son. We are loved, forgiven and free. That is our privilege. That is our message. And to love, forgive and liberate. That is our task for all the world. Amen. Loving and forgiving God, we come to you today recognising that in matters of ethnicity, we have no choice. We are who we have been made to be. Before you, we rejoice at our diversity and our hearts lift at your great vision of a worshipping multitude gathered from every nation, tribe, people and language. But nonetheless, we recognise that our present reality is very far from this ideal. We acknowledge that the sin of racial hatred and prejudice distorts your divine plan for our human lives. You created us in divine likeness, diverse and beautiful, but too often we fail to recognise your image in all. Forgive us. You created us in divine freedom to be free, but too often we fail to choose to advocate for your justice for all. Forgive us. You created us for divine abundance to tend and share, but too often we fail to create that community which includes all and gives to all equal access to your abundant life. Forgive us. Before you, and in the name of Jesus Christ, who loves all people equally, regardless of ethnicity, gender or social status, we come now to recommit ourselves to your vision for the world. Father, forgive us. Open our eyes to distinguish good from evil. Open our hearts to desire good over evil. Strengthen our wills to choose good over evil, so that we may create among us your beloved community. Father, we come now to pray your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven and to commit ourselves to bring about your coming kingdom of equality and justice in our lives, in our churches and in our communities. We pray for the churches. May they become places of reconciliation where each human soul is valued and where equality in Christ is a reality in our midst. Forgive us those times where we do not live out our calling as your people. May our churches model the humanity of Christ to those in the communities where we live. We pray too for leaders in government, in the civil service, in health and education, in financial institutions and other organisations as they plan and work out the way forward. Guide their decisions, Lord, so that all may be safe and feel protected cared for and supported where they work, study or live. We pray especially for funding for communities and charities so that they may be able to support those who need it most at this time, the sick, the elderly, those who live alone or in poverty, the vulnerable and those whose mental or physical health has been nev negatively impacted by the current crisis. Father, we pray for families, couples, parents, children and relatives who are struggling either with too much time together or the opposite, the loneliness of not being able to see each other as much as they would like. Strengthen family relationships. Give us patience and greater love for each other. Console those who have lost members of their families during this crisis and have not been able to share their grief with others or to attend the funerals because of the restrictions. 
Be with all who grieve in their sadness, Lord, and may they feel your comfort and strength to persevere until restrictions are eased. Dear Lord, we pray for those who are working so hard at the minute, for key workers, medical staff, teachers, carers, and all others who find pressures have increased in these changed times and are feeling weary. May your presence with them provide the strength needed today and help us all to look to you as our guide in these changing times. May we come to know you more thoroughly. May we trust you more completely. And may we follow you more courageously. And so we bring our prayers to you in the words our Saviour taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And so we come to make our prayers for the dedication of our offerings. Let us pray. Generous and loving God, in the giving of our money we are offering a symbol of our love for you. Bless it with your grace, that it and we may be used in proclaiming good news to all your world. Amen. And so that brings us to the, our end of worship this morning. That statement against racism that was passed at conference can be found on our Irish Methodist Church website. Alongside it, a statement that was also released by our Youth Department Youth Ambassadors. And just also to remind you of our Bible study tomorrow night at half past seven on Zoom. And this week will be entitled Generosity in a time of crisis. So until our time of worship again next week, goodbye, stay safe and God bless. <laughs>